Hi, this is Jeff Heen. In this video, we're going to talk about how to encode real-time data, so time series data as it's going into a model like a neural network. But in particular, we're going to focus on how to encode financial data, so currencies or the stock market or other things like that. We will go all the way from individual ticks to higher level encodings of that data for example, candlesticks and other things such as that. To see all my videos about Kaggle, neural networks, and other AI topics, click the subscribe button and the bell next to it and select all to be notified of every new video. So let's start at the very, very bottom where this data is actually coming from. Usually when you're dealing with time series data, it is in very precise intervals, but that's not at all how this data is usually collected. In finance, you are dealing with individual ticks. So let's look at how the ticks are organized. For a market to work, there must be both buyers and sellers. A buyer wants to buy a security. Essentially, this could be a stock, currency pair, or something else entirely, like an option on one of these. There are also sellers who will provide these securities. The buyer often wants the security at a specific price. This is a bid. The seller often wants to sell the security at a specific price. This is an ask. If there is a spread between the bid and an ask, no sale occurs until someone crosses the spread. One way for this to happen is for the buyer or the seller to place a market order. For example, a buy market order will buy the security at the best available ask price. Now a sale has occurred. This is what is often reported for a simple stock quote. Data coming in might be those bids and asks, or it might be those individual sales. Either way, the important thing is they happen when they happen. It's not at minute bars or second bars or things like that. The bars happen at a much higher level when things are actually consolidated together. So let's look at both of those two. Let's start with the bids and the asks. That's where you get into your level one and level two data. Here you can see level two data. This is Apple again, and this is Apple from just uh, today actually, so the price uh, is reflective of that. You can see that there are essentially the bids and the ask. You can see that there are several levels of that. If you're dealing with just level one, there's only going to be one level. You're going to just have the best bid, the best ask, and whatever that lot size. You can see the numbers there that are showing you the lots. Those numbers show you how many 100 unit values are available at that particular price. So always add in those two zeros at the end. Most level two data and level one will do that. Level two becomes important because if such a large order is placed, or if you're right on the, the border of that, part of your order might be placed at the less good price of the next, the next road on that level two data. Another way that you'll commonly look at the data is not really the bids and the asks you're going to rather look at the sales that actually happened. So that final sale, when the two came together and a sale was actually made, you'll have those values. Now those also at this very, very low level are not coming in at any sort of minute bar or other thing. This is tick level data. So you're, you're getting those sales literally as they come in. This is what that sort of data looks like. You've got the timestamps and you've also got the price that the stock is at or other security. Now you're not getting the bids and the asks. So however you're representing this data, you start to lose information as you summarize more and more. So if you're dealing just with the sales, you're losing those bids and the asks. And you have to ask yourself for the way that you're encoding, for the predictions that you want out of this model, do you care that you lost the, the bid and the ask prices? Or do you care if you've lost the level two data where you've now got a really complicated structure that you need to deal with because now you've got several of these lots 
on both the bid and the ask size together. Now, I'm not going to deal so much with how you encode the bids and the asks. I don't usually deal with that too much. What I'm going to show you is how you'll encode those little individual sale prices as they come through at varying time slices. Usually those get summarized up into something like a candlestick or something like that. Now, the reason that we are summarizing these is because models like a neural network or other types don't deal real well with data where you've got a timestamp, then a price, another timestamp, then a price. What is the distance between these timestamps? It is quite variable. And that is really what the models don't deal with all that well. Unless you're encoding those spaces and the timestamps into it through your, through your feature engineering. But let's just think about how we get them into those fixed slices of time. That's where the candlestick charts look really good to a model. Because the candlesticks, you're dealing in bars. So do you have minute bars, day bars? heck, even year bars, depending on if you're looking at something over a really long period of time. The size of that bar, the amount of time that is encoded into the candlestick, specifies how many of these ticks are going to actually roll up into one of these. So let's see how we would actually do some of this in code in Python. Now I have the Jupyter Notebook that this all runs from linked into the description of this video if you'd like to have access to any of this code. So here I am going to load in some actual tick level data and this is sample data so it's a number of years old but it lets us put the code through the steps it's kind of annoying but the csv files that they give you do not have the headers on it so i put the headers in myself most of these i do not particularly want now this gets back to the whole thing of how much information do you want to throw away you typically have to throw away information i mean think of yourself as you drive down the street you're throwing away a ton of information you're only really focusing your brain on things that are going to potentially run into you and where you are going. At least that's how I drive. So that is what you need to be aware of. It's a pick and a choose as you come up with different strategies and different neural networks and other models. So I'm going to drop all of these. And then if we look at the head of this, this is what the tick data really looks like. This is your fundamental data. You can see these are all happening on a date back in 2014. And we have the individual time. Now it's very important that the time is very precise because you're often getting several different ticks per second. This is the price that it's at. So it's not varying a tremendous amount. And then the size. Now be aware of your data. This might be in lot or this might be in the actual units of the of the security i believe this is lots because this is this is a three you wouldn't probably see that odd of a number there now just so that i can sort this i'm going to put in a timestamp because i need to bring the date and the time into one so that i can truly sort these and i'm going to change that into my index now i can do this really really cool resample function I can choose whatever size bar I want. Now I keep referring to bar and you might not know exactly what I what I mean by that. So in a lot of charts that you'll see, and we'll see one of them in a moment, they're candlestick charts, they have bars and the, the amount of time from here to here on this bar needs to be uniform. It might be a minute, it might be an hour, it might be something else entirely. This shows there could be a thousand ticks in this bar. There's no limit, and each bar does not necessarily have the exact same number of ticks because they cover set amounts in time. So from zero to one second, one second to two second, or zero to one minute, one minute to, to whatever. Usually a minute bar is about the smallest that I've so this is the highest of all the ticks that it was during this time frame. This is the lowest of all the ticks that it was at this time frame. 
And this is where it started, and this is where it ended. So this gives you a nice summary. Now the high and the low, you don't necessarily know what order that came in. Did it go up or did it go down? That's why this whole thing is usually green if it went up and red if it went down. We'll, again, see that in a moment. But this is what we're summarizing it to. So I am summarizing it to one minute bars OHLC, open, high, low, close. And I'm going to go ahead and run that. And this shows you for each bar, it opened at this, it closed at this, high and low. Now you can use this to plot your candlestick charts, and that's what we're going to do in a moment. But these are also great inputs into a model. Actually, they're not great inputs into a model, and we'll get into that in a second, but they're the starting point. Notice all these NANs. That is because literally for this particular bar, there were no ticks in that particular candlestick. Usually with equities, this is because the market was closed at that particular time. Even Forex is closed at certain times, but not nearly as much as the equity markets are closed. And when I say equity, I mean the stock market versus Forex, which is the foreign exchange currencies. And you always trade those in pairs, like EUR, USD, that sort of thing. So Euro to dollar. Now let's take a look at a plot. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. It takes it a moment to render the plot. And this is an interactive plot. So this is kind of fun to play with. Here you can see it stopped right around here and then the market reopened. So this was the, the after hours effect which definitely can. They, when you go to the next day, they don't, equities don't necessarily open exactly where they uh, had closed. So let's go ahead and zoom in on one little area of this. And you can see, you can basically drag this down here and look at different parts of it. If this were Forex currencies, it would be, there'd be much less black area because it's it's global you don't you don't close the currency markets nearly as much as you do these let's go ahead and swing this in so that we get even more you can now you can see the candlesticks and you can sort of see why they're called candlestick that one does look like a candlestick it's got a little wick on top and nothing coming out of the bottom of it because it might have closed, the closing price might be the highest or the lowest that it's ever been. So it doesn't necessarily have to have the top and bottom parts of it. This one, for example, right here, opened relatively low and shot up and sort of erased that gain on the next bar. So you can expand the size of this also. We can make these be, I'm not gonna do day because we don't have a lot of data here, but you can make it hour, much less data. So as you ratchet this up, you throw away more and more data. And it's all a matter of how you want to represent this. Now remember I said high, low, open, close bars are not necessarily the best input into a neural network. You don't wanna necessarily make your time series maybe be 10 of these, and then you would have four inputs, one for high, low, open, close. The reason that I don't like putting those directly into there is the number represents truly what this was at. So you're always sort of looking for patterns in this sort of technical analysis. Like maybe you wanna find a cup. Well, if the cup is way up here, or way down here, it's the same shape. And it probably means the same thing. So you want to make these somewhat agnostic of how high or high low the, the stock is, especially when you use one algorithm that was trained on one stock to apply it to another, or one currency pair to another currency pair. So because of that, it's better to represent them relative. So what percentage move did this make based on the previous one? That's one way to do it. There's all sorts of ways to represent these. Okay, so this is a little deeper dive into how you might represent time series data, particularly financial data into this. If you found this interesting, make sure you click like and subscribe. Believe me, that is the vote that I count for what topics I want to cover in the future. If you'd like to see more depth on this or see how to literally put this into a neural network for prediction, 
let me know in the comments and click those like buttons. Thank you for watching this video.